Paul has, has uh, uh, graciously volunteered me to sing a song. But before I sing it, before I sing a song, I want to read a psalm. Psalm 92. It's called a song for the Sabbath. Today is today is the Sabbath. Today is the, is the, the seventh day, biblically speaking, which is honoured by the Jewish people, uh, and which the Creator has set aside for Himself. But uh, as Paul teaches, let no one be uh, condemned by keeping or not keeping a particular day. But I'd like to give honour to this day by reading this, this psalm, which is a dedication for the for the Sabbath. Psalm 92. It is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your na name, O Most High, to declare your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness every night. On an instrument of ten strings, on the lute and on the harp, with harmonious sound, for you, Lord, made me glad through your works. I will triumph in the works of your hands. O Lord, how great are your works! Your thoughts are very deep. A senseless man does not know. Nor does a fool understand this, when the wicked spring up like grass, and when all the workers of iniquity flourish, it is that they may be destroyed forever. But you, O Lord, are on high forevermore. For behold, your enemies, O Lord, for behold, your enemies shall perish, all the workers of iniquity shall be scattered. But Mahorn, you have exalted like a wild ox. I have been anointed with fresh oil. My eyes also have seen my desire on my enemies. My ears hear my desire on the wicked who rise up against me. The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. He shall grow like a seed in Lebanon. Those who plant in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of their God. They shall still bear fruit in old age. They shall be fresh and flourishing to declare that the Lord is upright. He is my rock and there is no unrighteousness in him. Glory be to his name. Yeah, we go with this. I'm glad I get tired of years. I'd like to sing a song about Jerusalem, if I may. Avi harim zalul kayaim ve'ehachorani. Nisa beruach harbaim im kol pahamonim uf tarimat ilan vayven shvuya bechaloma hayre sher badai yosheve uveli barkuma Yerushalayim shel Veshel nechoshet, veshel or, alo lechol shiraich, ani kinor. Yerushalayim shel zahar, veshel nechoshet, veshel or, alo lechol shiraich, ani חזרנו אל בורות המים, לשוק ולכיכר. שופר קורא בהר הבית, בעיר העתיקה. ובמרות אשר בסלע, אלפי שמשות זוכות. נשוב נהר אל ים המלח, בדרך ירי. Yerushalayim shel zahav Veshel nechoshev veshel or Alo lechol shirai Ani kinor Yerushalayim shel zahav Veshel nechoshev veshel or Alo lechol shirai Ahani kino kino.
reason I sang this song is because it is a, in part, a, a very joyful but also a very tragic song. The song was written in 1967 by a woman called Naomi Shema, and it was written and published only a week before the Six Day War. And in this song, she wrote, she declares the sadness that they are not able to go to the to the Dead Sea by the way of Jericho uh, because of the of the uh, the way the borders were, and they, she laments that there's no uh, shofar, no trumpet blowing on, on the on the Temple Mount anymore, and then she's lamenting that, and there's no way of knowing. She has no way of knowing that she didn't know what is going to happen. A week later, Jerusalem was back in Jewish hands and prophecy was fulfilled, I believe. And then she wrote the last verse, I only sang two verses. And she wrote the last verse, and now we're able to go back to the Dead Sea by the way of Jericho. Now the trumpets, the shofar is blowing again on the, on the, on the Temple Mount. And today, the Israeli government is happy to give away the Temple Mount, to give away all these things that were gained, all these things the Bible says belong to the Jewish people. It's a very tragic song in many, many ways because this longing expressed in the first three verses of, of, of the song and then fulfilled in the last verse are now squandered away again because of fear of what the international community would do to them. So I just want to share this with you because what we're doing here is in a sense not that much different because the world is longing for, as Paul says so eloquently in Romans uh, uh, chapter 8, all of creation is longing for the revelation of the sons of God. And until now, even though the Son of God appeared 2,000 years ago, the sons of God are still pretty well invisible in the world today. And it is a very, very tragic situation. And, but I believe that what we're trying to do in re-establishing biblical truth, uh, that the world can again begin to see who the Son of God is and who the sons of God and daughters, it's all-encompassing, are really. So, as I said yesterday, the world is experiencing identity crisis particularly in, in, in spiritual matters. Today, there's such an enormous syncretism. Does you know what this word means? No, anybody need explanation? Syncretism is a mix and match of things. There's enormous syncretism of religious terminology and practice throughout the world. Once upon a time, there was a clear definition between uh, this is Hinduism, this is Buddhism, this is Christianity, this is Islam, and so on. Today, no longer the case. We just mix and match according to our own likes and dislikes. You know, we have Christians that are practicing yoga and, and various and diverse uh, Buddhist philosophies. Paul, could grab a glass of water from this? Or Hindu philosophies. It's all, it's all kind of tied into, into the whole, whole uh, box and dice. But the Bible says we are to be very clear in what we believe and what we teach. Tim, uh, Paul says to Timothy in one place, he says, whatever I've taught you, hand on to what men? Faithful men. Meaning that whatever I'm teaching, do not make sure that the people who receive this knowledge from your, from your lips, what I've passed on to you, this will not be changed and they will not change, will not alter anything. When a, a Jewish scribe writes the Torah, the, the books, the, 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 old, the, the books of Moses, it is made incumbent on him that he's not to alter one single letter. Jesus himself, or Yeshua, as I will call him for a reason, I will I'll, I'll explain in a moment. Himself has said in, in, in Matthew five, we read this account. Not one jot, not one tittle will disappear from the Torah until all things are fulfilled. 
A Torah scroll is not is is made in common English not to alter one single stroke of a letter, because they they say if one letter is lost from the Torah, it is as good as losing all of mankind, because one letter can make a big difference in the Hebrew language. The Hebrew language is made up of of a of a root of a system of of three root letters for each word. Now, if any of these letters are changed, uh, it can have a completely different meaning. Today, you and I are faced with some 50 different English translations of the Bible or interpretations. Uh, I won't point my finger in any of this at this point, but I like this. I want to say to you, and I say it without apology. Somebody said yesterday we sort of fit our expressions to the audience. You're like you know, you like to hear this, you want to hear this. And I don't apologize for what I'm going to say because I believe it is the truth. And it is incumbent on you and I to speak the truth in love. And I'm saying this to you in love today because because I love you, I'm saying those things in order that you may not go on or may not be caught in, in the, up any longer in the errors that are bedeviling the Christian world. And most likely the translational interpretation you hold in your hand is deeply flawed whether it's the King James, or whether it's the Message, or it's the New King James, or the NIV, or whatever. Uh, we, 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 I can point to you, if we had the time, but this is not the platform to do it, but I'm, I'm going to need to say it anyway. I can point you to countless errors in your, in your translations, which are theological platforms. The error does not need to be there, because the Greek text says the correct thing, and so does the, so does the Hebrew text. But it's our translators, our interpreters, who, who put the word into print, who have actually written something into it which is based on their theological interpretation of what the scriptures ought to say according to their way of thinking, not what it actually does say. And so you and I, we've been given documents that are flawed, and the entire Christian world is, has, is exactly the same problem. So we are, when you read your, your Bible, you actually subconsciously tapping into somebody else's theological view. But you have no way of knowing because most of your pastors are no longer skilled and no longer trained in the foreign languages. It's no longer, no longer necessary today for a Bible college student to learn Greek or Hebrew. As long as he studies his NIV or whatever it may be, that's good enough. He doesn't have to learn Greek or maybe just some elementary stuff so he can at least read it in the, in the concordance. I'm saying this as a as boy of background. I'm saying it because I love you, because I love the world that is out there. My heart aches when I see the countless number of people who are going to a lost eternity because they have no way of knowing what the truth is. Because we, who have been given the truth from way back from our Messiah, through His disciples, and for faithful people along throughout the centuries, we have not guarded it. We have not been faithful. In fact, we've been prevented from being faithful by people who had a theological bent in, in spreading something which is not biblical. And I've got a book there that is called Replacement Theology. It is something that has been there from the first century on, where men sought to divert the truth into their way of thinking, and they have succeeded, brothers and sisters. So anyhow, I've said that. Uh, so the world is in a in a in a, in a spiritual in a in a in a, uh, in a in a spiritual identity crisis. Is there anything in Scripture that would have a point to that? Yes. Jeremiah wrote in chapter sixteen, verse fourteen to eighteen. He said, "O oh Lord, my strength and my stronghold, and my refuge in the day of distress." To you the nations will come from the ends of the earth and say, Our fathers have inherited nothing but falsehood, futility, and things of no profit. I think it's an extraordinary statement to make so long ago. And this is being fulfilled right now. It's being fulfilled right now. What Jesus was speaking into was a world that was distorted 
had its, its, its spiritual identity distorted. And we have exactly the same thing here. Look it up in your Bibles. Jeremiah 16, verse 14 to 18. Oh, actually, 19 to 20, sorry. But the context is 14 to 18. It is, the, And what this makes it particularly interesting because it is is linked with the prophesied return of Israel to her promised possessions. And Israel is back in, this, in, in her land. Israel is there claiming her possessions. And in, the same, in, the, in, in that context, Paul, uh, uh, Jeremiah says this, that to you the nations will come from the ends of the earth and say, our fathers have inherited nothing but falsehood. And this is what we're battling with today. But before I go on, I just want to give you a little exercise in perception. Tell me who that is. And Paul has a prize. He doesn't know it, but he's got a prize for you. Here, listen carefully. Since the founding of the state in 1947-48, I have created untold suffering. I have been responsible for massive transfer of population and the creation of a huge refugee problem. I was carved out of an existing state and was set up specifically to be the home of one religious group. I am nuclear armed and have been the cause of several wars with my neighbors, any one of which could have escalated and dragged the world into a third world war. My politicians and government are generally believed and often proven to be corrupt. Who am I? Can you take us? Who was, how many people say Israel? Come on, show, show us the, doesn't know, how many, lift the hands up. Not about half. Any other takers? No? You've seen it, haven't you? No? Not the answer? It's Pakistan. It's Pakistan. Pakistan was formed in 1947. So it's, it is so easy, it is so easy to have a misconception of something. Okay. We need to pray for the people of Pakistan. My, I've got to move, move along. My talk today is entitled, Yeshua, the Son of God. Now, I've chosen to use the Hebrew name Yeshua instead of Jesus like a yesterday I used the word Elohim instead of God. I've done it for a particular reason, not to show how great my Hebrew is, but I've done it to highlight the need for us to return to basics. And the basic is the Hebrew scriptures or the Old Testament as we understand it. We need to return to base again in order to make a, a start. Uh, what has happened, and Anthony made a point of this yesterday, uh, of saying there's 38,000 uh, uh, denominations. The last I checked was 33,000, and I've actually mentioned this at one of the last talks, last seminars. Uh, so, but anyway, there's, there's in excess of 35 or thousand, uh, whether he's right or I'm right, doesn't matter really. 30,000 is already a number that is so incredible, it doesn't matter how much higher you go with it. Now, like he said, do they all have the truth? Well, some has been an error somewhere. But with 33,000, 30 or 30 plus thousand different denominations in the world. How did it come about? Because there was one group with a bunch of dissenters. So they went away and they took that part of that uh, background of the, of the group and added something to it as they thought it ought to be. Then they split again and they added a bit more to it from somewhere else. And eventually the whole thing does not resemble truth anymore. What did Jesus do? Yeshua. He stripped away all of the oral teachings of, of, of his people. And he said, you must go back to the Word of God. Because the oral teachings or the oral law, or the law is often referred to in Paul's letters, because he talks about two things in his, in his letters. 
it's not just all law. He talks about the Torah, but the written Torah, and he talks about oral law. But it, we need to be discerning, understand, to discern the two, because there's only one Greek word for those two, for those two terms, nomos. And it creates a conflict. And Christian world has always thought our law is law, so that's all means the books of Moses, and you know, therefore, etc. But Jesus, he asked them, and he himself, he stripped away all this, all the traditions of the elders. It's because it's because of your traditions that you're making the word of God null and void. Now let's transform this into, or transport that into the Christian world. How often do we make the word of God that says you shall love your neighbor as you love yourself from Leviticus? We make this null and void because for the sake of our altogether? Come on. You're not convinced. Altogether? Traditions. Traditions. And traditions are the number one killer in the world today. We go and kill Roman Catholics, we kill Protestants, we kill this, we kill that. Because of our tradition. Because we didn't do it the same way as you do it, so we kill you off. Whereas the Son of God says, love your enemies. Do good to those that hate you. He stripped away the traditions and went back to the word of what the basic word of God teaches. And the Old Testament or the Hebrew Tanakh is a book that teaches ethics that this world today hasn't even begun to grasp. And we as Christians, we have not tapped into it. We haven't found the courage to live those ethics in order to be the transforming power that this world really needs. The world does not need religion. I think Anthony made this point. Religion, as, as, as Karl Marx said, is the opiate of the people. Religion is the excuse behind which everybody hides. I've got religion. I go to church. Don't talk to me. I know everything. I go to church. My priest, my pastor, my minister, he's got all the answers. Who, was it great that made this point? I don't have to read the book. My pastor told me what's in it. <laughs> now, how many people do you know don't read the Bible because the pastor preaches from it on Sunday? Do we know people like that? I do know a few. My pastor preaches from it on Sunday. Do you care what the pastor preaches from? How do I know? He knows everything. You know, he preaches from the Word of God. Sorry, Anthony, it's not a sling at you. <laughs> <laughs> but he preaches from the Word of God on Sunday, so he must know. And I believe him. He's a good man. Yeah, okay. All right. Let's move right along. What I want to share with you today, and what I really want to impress on you today, is how we understand the Son of God. And the significance of that meaning, Son of God. Today there's a, a power rising in the world that, uh, can anybody tell what this power is? Islam. Islam, yeah? You give me the idea. You give me the idea. Islam. And Islam clearly states that Allah has no son. And I wrote about this in my book you know, many years ago, six years ago now. And it is, it is the pivotal point for this world. There's approximately one and a half billion Christians, but one and a half billion Muslims, and the rest of them are divided into uh, different uh, Asiatic religions and animistic religions or no religions at all. So we've got half the world is battling over this concept whether God has a son or it doesn't. Now we talked about it briefly last night and I, I can't get into the details because it's, it's a different topic but maybe some other time we can have a seminar on this and it'd be you know, a good thing really to, to go deep into that. But for, for today I want to just present to you the need why we need to understand who the Son of God is. That we can't just simply say, well, Jesus is the Son of God. There is an active meaning attached to that because of what the Son of God did and what God did through Him. Two things. He did something and God did something through Him. So let's just 
John writes in his, in his, in his uh, gospel, and truly Yeshua did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Yeshua is the Messiah, the Son of Elohim, and that believing you may have life in his name. Now, there's a, a huge significance to this statement. Because what the Christian world has done since the beginning, since the early centuries, they have either deified him to an extent that he now takes the Father's place on the throne, which most modern worship songs have it. They no longer sing, we no longer worship the, the Almighty on his throne, but we worship the Son in his place. Was this the desire of Jesus? When, when the devil confronted him, now I know many of you don't, or some of you don't believe in the, in the devil, but I do. When the devil confronted him according to Matthew's Gospel, he said, if you will fall down and worship me, you can have all his kingdoms, I'll give them to you. And he says, there's only one you shall worship, and that is God. So he, he separated himself from his father. In other places he says, my father is greater than I am. So he never ever took the place of his father. But 20th century or 21st century Christianity knows better than that and says, no, Jesus has taken the place of the father. In fact, there is no father. There's only Jesus. Jesus' only churches have made this thing very clear and to make a deep inroad into the Christian world in a, in a very subtle, in very subtle ways. There is no father anymore. There's only the, there's only the son. And this is one of the big, big pitfalls for the Christian world. They would no longer differentiate between the Father and the Son. But John makes it very clear. He says that you may believe that Yeshua is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life. Why is it so important? Because Islam says God or Allah has no son. And it's the same angel that spoke to, to Miriam, to the mother of Yeshua, saying, you will have a son by the Most High. You will have a son by the Holy Spirit, and he shall be called the Son of the Most High God. Wow. But Allah says, who's supposed to be the same as the God of the Bible, he says, I have no son. And it's the same angel that tells Muhammad that Allah says he has no son. So what happened here? If it's the same God, then the God is schizophrenic and the angel is schizophrenic. Or has a problem with forgetfulness. <laughs> that 600 years earlier he'd come to a woman, to a Jewish woman in, 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 in uh, Nazareth and said, you're going to have a son. Uh, but he forgot. He forgot that his son died on a cross and was resurrected. Now he says he has no oh, Allah, he has no son. Sorry, he has no son. No. So here's a big issue. Of course, that translates them also further along into the resurrection, death and resurrection of, of Jesus, and, and the problem gets worse. So here is a foundational thing that the Christian world needs to go back to. That there's a father on the throne. How why is he father? Because Jesus said you call him father. Right. There is Father God is on the throne. And Paul teaches clearly in Timothy there's one man at the throne of God. One mediator, the man, the Messiah, Yeshua. One mediator between God and man, Yeshua, the Messiah. And these are, just, these are biblical statements, and it is important that. If we are to have any impact on the world, we need to be clear with our language. We need not to be fuzzy. I saw somebody's got the message here, uh, whatever, and no personal, you know, what? Are you hearing the message? Yeah, no personal attack on the message. But Eugene Peterson has taken awful liberties, awful liberties, in the way he translated, this, he translated the scriptures. And, uh, uh, but if you take that particular, his translation, and it translated into another language, what would he have then? It's like playing Chinese whispers. 
You know, one starts off here with a, with with Mickey Mouse, over there comes out with an elephant. <laughs> right? You know the game, don't you? Who doesn't know the game? Chinese, Chinese whispers. Yeah, you, know, you know perfectly what I'm talking about. You know, I guarantee, if we start off with one word here, there'd be something interesting coming out the other end here. <laughs> so we, this is human nature. So if I take something like like the scriptures and I do not pass it on correctly as it is written or as close as possible the way it is written I will end up with a problem for somebody so when it comes to Yeshua the Son of God we also need to be precise in understanding so who is that man it has vexed the people since the very early disciples Yeshua said to them when they were at Caesarea Philippi he says who did the people say that I am so they came up with different answers, you know, you know or some say you're the prophet, some say you're Elijah, some you're this and that. But says, okay, great. But what do you say? Who do you say that I am? And that is the question, brothers and sisters. We have each one of us have to ask ourselves, who is he? Who is he? Let us not be content with with common terminology of what is being taught. Let us investigate, and I put it on you, I, I really put this on you in a heavy way. You owe it to yourself and to your children and your children's children and to your neighbors and to anybody, to your country, to your church, that you know as deeply as you can possibly know who the Son of God is. That you don't leave a stone unturned. Because if you don't know who he is, how will you recognize him when you stand before him? For heaven's sake. Somebody told, my son-in-law told a story that I shared with some people yesterday. Uh, a man comes to heaven, comes to the pearly gates, and uh, he knocks on the door, and uh, Peter opens up, and he says, yes, can I help you? And he says, oh, I'd like to come in. Oh, just hang on a second, I've got to step aside. I'll just get someone to take over from me. So he goes inside and, and Jesus walks past and says, Could you please come over here? I'll just man the door for me for a while. And, and, and so Jesus says, Yeah, that's okay. Uh, and, and so he says, Man, is it, can I help you? Jesus says, And he says, Yes, I'd like to come in. He says, uh, Why? What have you done on earth? He says, Well, I was a carpenter, a cabin maker. All right. He says, uh, uh, And uh, what is your name? He says, My name is Joseph. Okay. And uh, why would you want to come in? Well, he says, well, because I've done good things and uh, I'd like to come in. And so at that point, Jesus stops and says, Joseph, are you my dad? And Joseph says, Pinocchio! <laughs> <laughs> A matter of perception. Who is that man? Is he Pinocchio to you? Or is he the Son of God? Is he the Son of God who is revealed to us in the book of Revelation that stood before John and John fell flat on his back or on his face when he saw him? Are we truly prepared to face the Son of God that we read about in Psalm 2? They will come to rule this world with a rod of iron. Are we prepared for that? Are we, are we looking for uh, a, a blonde-haired, blue-eyed, benign, uh, meek and mild Jesus of... Uh, 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 what's the song? Uh, away in a manger stuff? Is that what we're looking for? Or are we looking for the Son of God as He truly is? That's what the Bible says that he is. Is that what we're looking for? Yeah. Right, I believe we are. But we need to be clear in our terminology and how we convey this to people whom we're looking for. We're no longer looking for somebody that's, that hangs on a, on a cross in a lap lap. But we're looking for a, a glorified human being that will rule this world. It says, says in Revelation, with a rod of iron. Now, this is a word that is really scary for some people. Because some people think a rod of iron, this is going to be a tyrant. 
But Jesus calls himself, I'm the good shepherd. And when you read Psalm 23, what is it said there? What does David say to the Almighty? He says, your crook and your staff do what? Alright, what does it mean to comfort you? Does it mean they love singing to sleep? Or, or, or yeah. Ah, right. So Jesus is portrayed as the mighty one who will use not just a, a wooden crook and staff, like David would have used as a shepherd, but a rod of iron. In other words, his might is beyond what? It is just overall. It's just, it's just shown as the, as the overall mighty ruler. Isaiah spoke of that. He's going to be a mighty ruler. And, and the, Bible, the Bible teaches us that. So the question I'm asking today who is Yeshua to you? And there are four aspects that I want to look at today. One is that the, the Son of God we were talking about is God's agent of redemption. He is the crown of the Torah, the Word made flesh. And finally, He's the crown of creation. Let's just talk about the Son of God and moving right along. How do we know He's the Son of God? What, what, makes, what makes Him uh, so different? Uh, and I believe there's the, the starting point for identifying Him is the resurrection. And I got really excited some weeks ago when Peter Barford, he sent a, 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 an article around where he talked about the same thing. And I'd already written my talk for this thing and I said, hey, this is exciting. He's somebody who believes exactly as I do. The resurrection is the single most identifying mark that Yeshua is the Son of God. Why is that? Well, ne nobody else has ever been raised from the dead, so therefore this man has to be different. But resurrection is the single most unfailing testimony that the Almighty has begun something entirely new. It has never happened in history before. People have been raised from the dead. Elisha did. He raised people. Jesus raised people from the dead. He brought them out of the tomb, like Lazarus, after four days. But these were like revivals and, and, and a type, maybe perhaps a type of resurrection. But all these people, as far as we can tell, we're not told any different, they all died again. They all died again. And they're not alive today, so they must have died. But Yeshua is still alive today, we're told. Because he was seen after he came back, he was raised from the dead. It wasn't that somebody on earth walking up to his tomb and knocking on and said, please come out. But it was the mighty power of God that raised him from the dead. And thereby, he clearly showed that this man is somebody special. He is not like any other man. And as Moses said in, in, uh, in, in Deuteronomy, I think it's chapter 18, when he says, and for God will raise up a prophet like me from among your brethren. And to him you shall listen. To him you shall listen. And if you do not listen to him, I will take you to task. So we are called upon to listen to him because God identified him by the resurrection as somebody unique in his scheme of things, in his scheme of the redemption. So therefore, he has... And, and uh, he takes in a place like no other being ever on this earth. So it is the resurrection, it, it sets him apart from any great teacher, Gandhi, whomever, whomsoever, any, or even the prophets. According to Islam, he's one of 124,000 prophets. But according to the word of God, he's just one. He's the most unique of all human beings. And so he's the culmination, or resurrection is the culmination of the redemptive process. And two, that the kingdom of God is not only an approaching reality, but it has actually broken into the world of Adam. As Paul points it out in, 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 in chapter 
in Corinthians 1, Corinthians 1, in 1 Corinthians 15, 12 to 18, that if resurrection is not, is not a reality, then all of us who put a hope and a trust in it are the most, are to be most pitied of all people. Because we have nothing else. Because that is what our hope is, that we shall be raised like Jesus was uh, in order to, to, uh, to live in God's kingdom and to function as God's people. Why was the resurrection necessary and why is it so significant to understanding the meaning of the Son of God? Point one is the resurrection is the clearest testimony to the redemptive process. It's a foreshadowing of a restoration of the earth of which the Creator declared it was very good. Yeshua demonstrated something brand new, and Paul alluded to this yesterday, that what the new world will be, that we will be part of a different dimension that we cannot grasp as yet. Because the kingdom of God is not just a physical thing. It is, there's more to it. But to this day, until our resurrection, until this day comes, our eyes are closed to that. We cannot uh, enter that. Uh, but God uh, breaks in and sometimes into, into our dimension. The resurrection also cuts right across the mistaken belief of an eternal existence in an ethereal heavenly sphere residing in spiritual mansions and amusing ourselves with harps and eternal banquets while dressed in nighties. Uh, why bother to resurrect dead bodies on this earth when they already exist in heaven as much as Christian theology envisages? Yeah, why, should, why bother to resurrect people? Why bring somebody who is already in heaven back into the grave in order to bring him out again it does not make sense it doesn't make sense if you're in heaven and this is your, what the existence is going to be like a disembodied spirit or with a, 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 an ethereal body why come back why, why for God to bring him back into the ground reconstitute all these bits and pieces that, that may or may not be there or to go into a shark's mouth or into, into the depth of the sea or somewhere and, and to find all the bits and pieces of the mud of the ocean and, or, or somebody who's been blown up by a bomb and all this kind of stuff. Why go through all this trouble to all that in order to bring it back, to let go of this body and go back to heaven to become an, an, an invisible being? When he clearly demonstrated through the resurrection that when you come out of death, on the other side of death, there is a different life, a life that is glorious, a life that reminds us of will be like it was in the garden before Adam sinned. The resurrection declares also that the Almighty is vitally interested in, in replacing his, this corrupt humanity with one that is reborn and reshaped in the image of his Son to rule over the earth at the head of a new and redeemed humanity as he intended it from the very beginning. So it is by the resurrection that Yeshua was shown to be different from the rest of humanity. He was raised as a consequence of a life of obedience he lived towards the Father. And as Steve pointed out yesterday, like the cross and the attending events are not part of some divine theater, but the interaction of Rebellion and hatred towards God on the one side and total obedience on the other. I'll say it again. It's an interaction between rebellion and hatred towards God and total obedience on the other. Is obedience important for God? Well, let me say what, is, what he does not like is in Genesis 3 tells us clearly that this obedience of Adam is the cause for us being here today. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 20, he says, As the nations which the Lord destroys before you, so you shall perish, because you would not be obedient to the voice of the Lord. So God views disobedience very, very seriously. On the other hand, He rewards obedience. For as by one man's obedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's 
about one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. Romans 5.19 My second point is this God's agent of redemption. That the world cannot deal with the Son of God and as a consequence they have disempowered Him. The world doesn't like Him because he, Jesus, you are sure, He challenges everyone to repent. And repentance, as you know, does not mean doing confession or doing penance, but repentance means a, ch a total, an utter and total change of heart. Now, if I have a total change of heart, it changes also my actions. And the responses I need to give to various aspects that come at me. So the world does not like that. Even the Christian world doesn't like it. Because we have invented something new. We've said, Jesus has done it all for me. I don't have to do anything. I don't have to come along for the ride and collect my reward. My golden key, when I, just before I get to the pearly gate, there's a little push button thing that I press the button and says, Are you, do you belong to Jesus? Yes. I get a key and that's it. But is that really what the Bible teaches? I don't believe so. The Bible says from the very beginning, change your ways. Moses said to his people in Deuteronomy, Today I've set before you what? Life and death. And to do what? All together? Choose life. Choose life. Choose life. And this choosing of life means a change of heart. And unless we have this change of heart, nothing will happen. And this is why the world hates the Bible. Because no other book demands it of anybody. Every other religious book just says, oh, just believe in this, believe in that, do this, do that, whatever. It does not demand a change. The Bible says, you want to be God's people, change. He said it to Israel, and Jesus said it, says it to us. <coughs> so, they don't like him for that. They also, they have him, there's some common Christian fallacies. He ne Jesus never comes off the cross. Roman Catholics, one billion of them, have him on a, on a crucifix, dressed in a lap lap, and that's where he is. And he's worshipped as such, and he's used as an amulet as such, as a, to, to ward of evil spirits and to bring healing. And, but he never comes off the cross. And it's easy. I can hang him up on a wall. I can put him in a cupboard. I can hang him around my neck. It doesn't really affect him because he do, he's done something. I don't have to do anything about it. He does it all. You know, hang him there in his lap lap. And it's just as an aside, did Jesus, was Jesus crucified in the lap lap? No. no. He was crucified how? Naked. naked. Completely naked. And he was crucified at the height like this to expose his manhood, his Jewish manhood, his circumcised Jewish manhood to every eye that walked past at eye level. Why is that so? Because for the Jewish people, nakedness is an abhorrence. And I'll talk about this tomorrow. Why? Theologians have turned him into a Christ of faith. He does not have to be a historical person. As long as you have some sort of understanding what that Christ ought to be, and this is good enough. Bultmann was the, was the chief architect of this theology, and he said the Christ of faith is the most significant aspect of our faith, of, of what we believe. He does not have to have historicity. It doesn't have to have a physical identity. And finally, by deifying him and seating him in the place of his father on the throne, which is probably the most damaging of all, because not only have we robbed ourselves of our Creator God, but we've also robbed ourselves of our Redeemer, because we have no one to identify with. I cannot become like God. I will never be God. But God has called me to become like His Son. So when I deify Jesus to such an extent that He replaces the Father, I'm saying, I want to be like God. And have we read this somewhere else in the Scriptures? Yeah. I shall exalt myself to above the throne of the Most High. I will this, I will do this, I will do that.
Do you get an extra 10 minutes for the, for the singing? Yeah. 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 Depends on the tape. Yeah. All right. I, I, won't, I, won't build, I won't build on it. We have disconnected him from, we have disconnected him from, uh, from his Hebrew ancestry. Uh, today there's a, a movement in the Middle East, or coming out of the Middle East, particularly out of, out of Gaza. Uh, it's called Palestinianism. Eight minutes. Okay. <laughs> Has anybody read the book uh, by Badia or uh, Arabia? Make a note of that. Buy it. Read it. It really will open your eyes in an incredible way. Arabia. Arabia. I make reference to it in my book, by the way, in, in the replacement theology. But Palestinianism holds that Jesus or Yeshua was an Arab. He was a Palestinian. There is no Jewish connection. Now, if there's no Jewish connection, he's not linked to Abraham either, is he? No. Okay. So therefore, he is a hybrid. He's something, whatever you want him to be. And this is theology that has laid, has, laid, has taken foot in Europe and in, in America. There's plenty of evidence of that now that they've done a very, very good job in promoting this, this particular theology. I can't go into all details, it takes too much time. We're talking about a Christ of faith, and we're talking about replacing the Father. What is the truth? He came to bring abundant life. Through what? Obedience. And he initially demonstrated through his, to his own people uh, But he demonstrated his obedience through his obedience to the Torah of his own people. Thirdly, he is the crown of the Torah, or the Word of God made flesh. John 1 14. Now, just quickly, um, before I run out of time. What sets him apart is the, his obedience to the Torah. He is the goal of the Torah. In Romans 10 verse, 10, verse 4, your Bible will say, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness unto all who believe. You have a mistranslation. Because the Greek text clearly says, For the Messiah is not the end, but the goal or the purpose of the Torah. The Messiah is the purpose of the Torah. And in Galatians, Paul teaches that the Torah is a schoolmaster to lead us to whom? To Messiah. The Torah is a schoolmaster to lead us to Him. The Torah is the purpose, the purpose of the, for the Messiah. And he brought something new also. For the Messiah is the goal of the Torah for righteousness to everyone who believes. And have a good read of it, have a good study, and you, and you will know exactly what I mean. He brought a new authority. He brought a new authority over evil spirits, over sickness, over death. And we are called upon to live in this authority also. Now I spoke about Allah having no son. But I just need to draw this to a close. And finally, he's the crown of creation. The Son of God is no ordinary being. Although he's in the form of likeness of man, he alone is worthy to come into the presence of the Ancient of Days. Uh, we find him mentioned in, in Psalm 2 in a very powerful way, and also in Revelation 19, it speaks of him that he's not just like ordinary men, but he will be the ruler of men in the coming kingdom to reign for a thousand years. And before, as Paul clearly says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 28, I think it is, when it is all done, then the Son shall hand the kingdom back to the Father, so that what? All together? That God may be all in all. Okay? So what do we have really? It is the fulfillment of what was begun in the Garden of Eden with the first Adam, who flunked it, God replaced him with the last Adam or the new Adam, and when he has fulfilled the whole thing, it will be complete and we'll start again in the Garden of Eden. 
or the world will be restored to an Edenic or pre-fall condition. And this is the purpose of the Messiah, and this is why he's such a unique being. Why is he unique? Because he's the first human being. Adam, the first Adam was created in the image of God. What does this mean, in the image of God? That he was a glorious being. He was not a naked ape. He was not a plucked chicken like you and I are today, who have to wear clothes so that we represent something. But he had a garment of light. Why? The Bible tells us that. You come into the presence of God and you've been touched by his light. Moses had to cover his face. People couldn't look at him. They were scared when they saw him. He's this glowing being there. Oh, Moses put a paper bag up in it. <coughs> When Jesus went on the Mount of Transfiguration, what happened? It says he was transfigured and his face and his garments shone like light. And he was met with by Elijah and by Moses who did what? They also glowed with light. God says, it says of the Almighty, he dwells in what? In unapproachable light. He's a being of light. And his ministers are flames of fire. fire. Hallelujah. So Adam was not a plucked chicken. Look at every creature out there. Look at the wonderful garments every single creature in this universe wears. The, the most insignificant insect, look at it under a microscope. It's a glorious creation. Every fish, every bird, every little creature that runs on the ground has a lovely garment of fur, feathers, or scales, or something. But it's gorgeous. Look at yourself. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Oh no, I mean, I, I, I'm speaking about myself. How many days? Two minutes. God did not create Adam like that. When Adam was made, when God breathed in him, when he said, he, he doesn't say in his nostrils, he actually says he, he, he breathed on his face. On his face. When God breathed on him, God doesn't have breath. He isn't like you and I. It's a metaphor. When God imparted to Adam the, his own life, his own life he imparted to Adam, and Adam became a nefesh chayat, a living soul. He was an animal body before, but he became a living soul. We can talk about it, we'll talk about it tomorrow. He became a living soul who was in the image of the Creator. He was, in other words, he was a being of light. He had a garment of light. When Adam rebelled, guess what happened? The light went out. This is why he saw he was naked. All of a sudden, say, oops, what's happened here? I need something to cover myself with. And God, in His mercy, he, he took animals, He took the life of innocent creatures to put garments on Him. And He's been doing it ever since for you and I. We have to kill, 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 kill so we can wear clothes. Brother, you wear leather jacket, okay? Something died for you, right? Okay? We still sacrifice animals today so we can wear clothes. And shoes. They don't give the skins up for nothing. <laughs> the sheep do. They, we see it in the book. Okay? Yeah, but you, yeah, but you want to let a sheep. You need to, you need to take the skin of the chicken, of the, the chicken of the, of the, of the sheep, right? You want a wool, You want a lamb skin cover? <laughs> you need the whole. You need the whole skin. Okay. So here's the crown of creation. God has restored in, in Yeshua what He began in Adam by imparting His own life. By speaking his word into the womb of, of Miriam. God spoke his life into her womb. And the son was generated. Who is the new Adam. The new creation. The head of a new humanity. To lead you and I and anyone else who wants to come into his kingdom. To live a glorious existence. Not some spooky you know, thing on the, on the harp. Playing harp somewhere up on a, on a cloud. But this is, this is the Son of God. And we need to lift a vision to whom He really is, to whom He was. He's not God, the Creator God. He's the Son of God. And He's not man like you and I. But He's a man, he's a man who was glorified by His Father because His Father is the originator. He's the Spirit of God that generated Him in Mary's womb. And He lived and died accordingly. And He lives in you and me today. Thank God. Okay? So I draw the close to that and I thank you for, for your patience. Thank you.